Hello chaps and chapettes. Welcome to week 31 of my study vlog. This is Scaramouche with All Good Things Vlogs. And first I'm going to kick off with a positive note. So today's positive note comes from the internet because they all do because nobody can send me anything but hey hey if you have a positive note please do send them in this one is a, about a well-known comedian in england at least who is called jason manford and i thought i'd just share this story because it's something that kind of touches on my childhood a little bit and i found quite fun and interesting um i like video games and i have uh, a bit of an idea of sharing a few times where I play a few video games in the future and I have uh, recently found out that Jason Manford does as well so what he has been doing is going ahead and uh, playing on a particular game particular series called Broken Sword now if you don't know the series they're really good games um, I've played them myself as I've said uh, in my childhood and uh, they do them on the phone as well which is quite cool they are a series of they're, they're sort of like the Sherlock Holmes of the 90s <laughs> and uh, they are a series about a reporter and oh, I forgot what a bloke's called I forgot what his job is he's almost like a sort of Indiana Jones slash uh, explorer type guy um, I just might know him as a, as a sort of swarmy american tourist sort of guy I, I feel like he doesn't actually have any sort of credentials to his name he just sort of he's got sort of swarmy but funny but cool but also awkward to his name um that's his that's his job title swarmy awkward american dude and the uh that they go and have to solve crimes particularly murders they uh are sort of the Indiana Jones and Lara Croft sort of duo but they're really interesting games and uh, Jason Manford puts his own spin on them which of course is comedic and funny so the the pair combined you can imagine it's, it's quite a good watch and um, he's been doing them over social media and the uh, on YouTube as well they're all worth a watch I'll stick a link down below so that you can find this if you want to watch it and I highly recommend it, it's a lot of fun. So on to week 31 of my study vlog and this week was about the art of Benin. Now if you remember last week, Benin was a city in uh, uh, more like the the western side of Africa and they had a they had a culture which was built up by the Beni people in a place called Benin City which is now more thoroughly known as Nigeria and it became very well known in Europe for its art so the Benin city was a thriving city and then there was an incident that happened towards the end of the 1890s where a group of British colonialists and missionaries and soldiers went and tried to force the Benin city to trade with them because they'd signed an agreement with the British Empire to trade with England and they, the, the English people felt they weren't upholding their end of the bargain. So these uh, soldiers led by Captain, or it was a, it was a bloke called Phillips, um, not, no relation to Tom Hanks' character or the real person who was on a ship. I think, I don't know, we're all related in some way, aren't we? We're all one big fang, happy family. So... <laughs> Tangents. They all carried off into uh, Benin City or tried to 
and were stopped and slaughtered and only two of this group survived. So England sent a punitive expedition, which is a punishing slash expedition <laughs> to go into St Benin City, essentially kick them all up the arse, tell them off and take their stuff um, and kill a few of them in the process because that's the British way. That proved quite fateful for the people of Benny. It uh, pretty much wiped them out. Anybody who wasn't wiped out either became a slave or became people who were sent in to understand other cultures in Africa, but were highly under the thumb of the, the British Empire. And all of the art, all of the items that existed in the Benin city were sent to Europe as way of paying for the punitive expedition and were sent across Europe and uh, sold. And a lot of these items were very confusing to Europe because all of the newspapers or most of the newspapers that went over to report on what had happened in Benin city went back and said that Benin City was basically a city of savages. They had sacrifices, they had people being strung out. There was, there was stories painted about blood being washed across streets and over buildings and there being bones, a whole field of bones just lying around. So when the art started to go to Europe, it didn't paint a picture of a culture that had come out of the, the Stone Age. It painted a culture that had real skill and real uh, ingenuity. Um, they, they'd created these Benin bronzes, if you remember, by creating casts uh, with wax and clay and then pouring in the uh, bronze, or uh, it was actually brass, um, but a lot of historians called it bronze because it was easier to do. Um, lazy, lazy historians. And they painted this picture of uh, savages that just didn't exist. Um, well, they, they weren't the same as Europe. So when they came to England, they and then were distributed across Europe a lot of people bought them specifically as art and a lot of people bought them in terms of the interests of how this culture came to be. You saw a very interesting divide. In England, it was more in interest in these works are uh, works of art and therefore we should hold on to them to try and explain how we went from savages who were throwing sticks and rocks at each other to a culture who can create these items and then you saw other areas who were uh, more interested in the the items themselves and explaining how the culture came to be. I think I've got that mixed up so I'm going to do that bit again. So you had a real divide between people who wanted to look at these items as works of art and sell them in galleries. And you had a different divide of people who were anthropologists and entomologists, I'm probably butchering that word, anthropologists, I think that's the closest one, anthropologists. Um, people who were interested in the people who created these items and finding out how they went from people who were throwing sticks and rocks at each other to a culture who could create these items. And so, right, from this bit onwards, I'm going to try and do the rest of it without going, and also, what you found was that with the distribution there was a lot of people who were interested in these items purely because they wanted to collect them. So you had people such as Pitt uh, 
let me use my notes here. So you had people such as Augustus Pitt Rivers, who was a British collector, and then Felix von Lipschein, who was a German collector. So Rivers, Pitt Rivers was interested, was more interested in trying to collect these items and put them into his own museum in Oxford where he was trying to use the Charles Darwin forms of explaining how life came to be. What is to say that Charles Darwin had used this, this information purely on animals and on plants, but Pitt Rivers was more interested in trying to put that and sort of copy and paste it over the idea of how humanity came to be. So when he was creating his, his display in his museum, he tried to create it in the form of a tree going from people who were using sticks and primitive items up to people who were, as he felt, the very European uh, sort of idea of people being uh, well known, well, well educated. And therefore you kind of got this sort of divide between people who were just seeing these items as another link in the chain to people who were genuinely interested about how these people came to be, how these people came to exist. And so that's where you get the anthropologists and anthropologists in Germany and Berlin who were more interested in trying to explore these items and find out how these people created them. And what you found was that this didn't really translate very well into museums because museums were there to try and entertain the public and to try and teach them. But anthropologists were looking at these items and wanting to categorise them and have detail and information and look at them and study them and find finite details, which the general public are generally not interested in. They go into the museum for a day out and if it's cluttered with things, they think, well, I'm not really in a museum here. I'm in an antique shop. Might as well be on the Antiques Roadshow going, hmm, well, that's nice. So... So there was this real clash between what the public wanted to say, what artists wanted to say, and what the collectors and anthropologists, scientists, museum creators, all of these people wanted out of these items. And generally there was a real confusion, there was a real difficulty in understanding how to properly categorise them. And that's what led to a lot of museums having vast collections of these items that were just stored away. Nobody could see them because nobody really knew how to display them. Museums that were trying to display everything at once were running out of space. Museums that had sparse information or displays that were more in terms of uh, galleries, uh, artistic galleries, were pretty difficult to understand as well. And eventually it came upon museums such as the British Museum and people such as, and I've got the names here, Charles Hercules Reed and Ormonde, I think I'm pronouncing that right, Ormonde Maddock Dalton, who put these items into um, more of a classification sort of order. They didn't put them all together, they sort of spread them out and they focused on both sides of things, both the creation of the items, how they looked from a historical and artistic viewpoint, and then also how they showed a culture that developed and grew over time. So trying to please both the public and the anthropologists at the same time. And that seemed to work the best way. That seemed to really interest and get the ideas that people had read about into the viewpoint of everybody who was interested in them. Didn't please everybody, but you can't always do that, can you? And eventually you got to a point where you started to find that uh, artists became interested in these items as well. But while they were interested in the, um, in the work of 
um, African artwork, the Benin sculptures through them. So these artists that I'm talking about are the avant-garde artists. They are the likes of Picasso and Monet. Uh, you've also got um, I'll just stick with <laughs> so these are artists so these are artists such as Picasso and Monet and they were looking at things in a very abstract way so the primitive art as they would call it the art of uh, of Africa but they didn't just single it out as Africa they singled it out as Africa India China anything that wasn't really European primitive art really inspired them However, the Benin art sculptures didn't really fit in with their viewpoint of what primitive art was because they were so superior, they were so different to what you were seeing in other works of art. So where they were looking for something that was edgy and gave a different viewpoint on what life was, these sculptures were more historical, they were more artefacts than anything, so they didn't really fit in with that view. And so there was a real sort of contrast of opinion as to what these items were. They didn't really fit in with what people thought or felt that African life was. A lot of people felt that the skill or the actual items themselves came from places such as Egypt, where you saw a similarity between those designs. Or again, from the Portuguese who had traded with these people. But the reason why the skill came to be wasn't linked in with the Portuguese themselves. When the items, when the main ingredients that they needed to create these items, namely zinc, started to come from traders, that's when these items started to come into existence in Benin City. They didn't necessarily come from the Portuguese themselves. And that kind of round things up in a bit of a confusing way. This was a really confusing chapter for me and I really struggled with it because you've got really, you've got the, the last chapter which was really historical based and then you've got this chapter which is trying to discuss whether these items are artefacts or art but it goes on so many different tangents that it's difficult to pin down where the actual ideas are coming from. If you want to see these items today, a lot of them are in different museums and what this didn't really touch on as much was the different conversations that are still ongoing about these items. There are still areas in Nigeria and in Benin City, because it still exists, where they want to have a ability to showcase these items and there is talk of them being rented out to them as such which okay it would be nice for the, those people who these items show their culture their way of life their history they exist but it doesn't give them back what they lost what was taken from them and it comes into an argument of whether these items are showing a history of benin or that they, where they are now, shows the history of the items themselves and the journey that they've taken. So I'm going to leave that there because it's very convoluted, it's very difficult and it's a subject that I probably like, might like to touch on in the future but I don't feel as though I'm doing it justice right now. So my question for you is if there's any particular item that you would like to see exist in the future, wherever, whatever journey it took, what would you like to see that would continue to go on and maybe show a piece of your history, show who you are? And normally I try and answer that myself, but I'm not 100% sure. I suppose the one item that I do treasure quite a lot, even though I'm not wearing it and I've not worn it for quite a while, sat on the wall right over there is a necklace that I used to wear when I was working as a medium and um, it's got a stone in it, the stone's changed quite a few times, it used to be amethyst, now it's Dalmatian Jasper but I always would wear it to give myself a bit of confidence and courage and I might wear it again in the future and it would also take a few 
of the heat weights off of my mind as well. So that's my item. What's your item? I hope for whatever reason you've enjoyed this episode, but otherwise I hope you're staying safe, you enjoy. If you like these, please subscribe. Um, doing so would help me know that you're enjoying them and that I should continue them. But otherwise, have a great day and all good things.